God's word comes to us today from Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 33. The word of God comes to us today from Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 33. Let us all rise together for the public reading of God's holy word. And this is the holy word of God. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked him, but who do you say that I am? Jesus, Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And now we come here to the part of the disciples' confession of who Jesus is. And it's such an interesting, it's been such an interesting journey we're here finally where it's, we've been seeing stories of the disciples not getting it. There seems to be this one high point where they seem to get it. And their confession of Jesus, of who Jesus is, is right. And so we pray, O oh God, that uh, we, or we confess, O oh God, that we are probably dumb, dumb like the, the disciples ourselves. And we ask that we too then, through the Spirit's illumination, through the revelation of God, that we too would see God, Jesus correctly. And that you would do that good work, even now, illumining the scriptures to our understandings, opening our hearts, our ears, and minds, so that we may readily receive your truth. But in order for that to happen, also hide your servant behind your cross, so that only Jesus is presented to your people this day. We lift this time to you. O oh God, we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> so after my, my first seminary degree, I, I did another degree. Uh, up in, in the Boston area at a school called Gordon-Conwell. And in Gordon-Conwell, it's about maybe 40 minutes northeast of uh, Boston proper. Uh, the city of Boston is, uh, I believe, the capital, sec the higher education capital of the world. I, I think it is the most densely uh, populated location of like colleges and, and um, What's that called? Uh, graduate programs and doctorate programs and stuff like that. And so because it's such a, a big location of education, what's interesting is they have something called BTI there, so Boston Theological Institute. And so all the divinity schools, all the seminaries, all any of the kind of schools that had theology uh, part of it, they all re uh, agreed to be part of this network where they can make several of their classes, which is renewed every year, uh, available to other students so that you can you can take it right and so it's a wonderful opportunity to go be able to visit another school visit another campus and so my uh, master's in theology was concentration was on theology and culture but uh, the school didn't offer a lot of classes on that particular topic and so uh, I accessed BTI and so lo and behold there was a school that had intro to theology and culture so I took it and it was at Harvard Divinity School and so I, took, I went to Harvard Divinity School with my eyes full open, full open, knowing that this is a school that doesn't believe in the Bible, that uh, considers Christianity more as an anthropological uh, storyline, right? It's more of a story of a group of humanity and of, of how they worshipped a god, right? So fully knowing that, uh, I was sitting in class one day, and the professor kind of asked this question about this particular scene that we read here in Mark chapter 8. Oh, by the way, I'm not preaching on uh, verses 22 to 26. I'm speaking on 27 to 33. And so in this particular scene of who is Jesus, she made this interesting point of how Jesus presents this question. He first asks, right, 
who do people say I am? Right? And the disciples respond, well, some of them, they say that you're John the Baptist, you know, revived, or Elijah uh, revived, or for, for sure, one of the prophets, right? And then he asks, and then she, she highlights, he asks, who do you say I am? And then before getting to what Peter says, she uh, brought out this point of saying, it's all about who you think Jesus is. Right? It's about what I think Jesus is. It's about what, you know, so even Jesus supported that with regards to not necessarily who Jesus is uh, as an absolute or as a truth. It all depends relatively, it all depends subjectively on who you think he is. And so the title of today's sermon is Subjective Christology. The media team said, well, Pastor David, your title today is really heavy. Like, what, uh, what does that mean? And so Christology meaning the study of Christ, right? Subjective being versus opposite of objective, right? So for our, for our youth students here, right? Um, they say art is subjective. Right? I, I don't get art. Uh, my wife is more art inclined, so I'll say, what does that mean? And then so she'll kind of tell me, but oftentimes it's also like, no, it's what you make of it, right? Because it just looks like a bunch of colors. I, I don't know what it is, unless it's, you know, painted by a person or pa painting of a person. Versus objective, where like, you know, we say two plus two equals four, right? Uh, that, that's supposed to be an objective thing. It, like, we, we can't say, well, I think it's five. <laughs> uh, technically, you can't have that kind of subjective approach. So here, we, uh, the, the, the case that I want to make kind of against what uh, this professor was advocating for, which is more also reminiscent and reflective of the signs of our times. It's not who Jesus is or was, assuming that you actually believe that he is a historical figure, right? Even that, sometimes we have to even go back and further back and ask that question. It's not about who Jesus is or was, but it's who Jesus is to you. And I want to make the case today that that's not what Jesus was getting at by asking this question this way. Right? Remember, last week we talked about the patience of Jesus and even the repetition of Jesus in the way he's teaching and discipling his disciples. And sometimes he'll repeat things. Like he, he fed thousands of people two times, hoping that they will get it, and they still didn't get it. And so his... Asking wasn't a promotion of relativism or a promotion of subjective understanding of who he is. He is drawing them to this understanding of truly who he is. He's saying, this is what people might say that they are. And this is who, who you might think I am, but I am about, but I am, but this is who I am. But surprisingly to the reader, after seeing all these kind of ups and downs of the disciples not quite getting it, Jesus letting out a deep sigh. That's what we read last week. Peter gets it. <laughs> Peter re responds. And oftentimes, we, we know Peter, right? We've seen, uh, growing up in the church, we hear the story of the disciples. We know Peter. He's always the act first, think later guy. He's a guy, step out of the boat and think that you can walk on the water and then start sinking guy. He's the guy who whip out your sword and cut off someone's ear before Jesus say, yo, stop. He, that's his guy. He's often the guy with the foot and mouth disease guy, where he regrets what he may have said. But here, he gets it right. And let me read for you the, the Matthew account of this same scene. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, Jesus uh, makes a comment on what, G, uh, what Peter said. Here, we don't see his response here, but in Matthew, thank God for the other synoptic gospels so we can get a fuller picture of what's going on. And Jesus answered, Matthew chapter 6, verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. That literally just means son of Jonah, Bar-Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Notice what Jesus says here. So Peter finally gets something right, and he says something correct, and Jesus' response to him is, good job, Peter. You've been listening, haven't you? Or good job, Peter. He doesn't commend him for his intellectual prowess. He doesn't com uh, commend him for his 
uh, religious piety or for his diligence. He doesn't commend him for his insightfulness. He actually attributes that true confession to what? Once again, not to his smarts, not to his religiosity, not to his effort, but he attributes it to, this was not revealed to you by flesh or blood. Not by your flesh, not by your blood, not by some other flesh, not by some other blood, but what? By whom? By my Father who is in heaven. God revealed this to you. God helps you, helped you to know who I am. And we see that it's not a subjective Christology. It's not subjective of who we might feel Jesus is or who we might think Jesus is, but rather, instead of like you would expect after saying subjective uh, Christology, you would want to say objective Christology. No, I'm going to say actually it's biblical Christology. But isn't that what we're endeavoring in here? Hasn't, haven't I been encouraging us that as we're going through the book of Mark, let us not try to try to maybe vaguely remember what we think about Jesus, what we remember, what we were taught about Jesus growing up in the church. Let us not try to kind of uh, think about what we heard about Jesus, but rather let's learn about Jesus straight from the source, from the text. And so the advocacy here is that I, we, I am in, exhorting us to look towards a biblical Christology. And so even in Jesus' interpretation and comment towards Peter's confession, he's saying, you didn't figure it out. People didn't tell you. God revealed it to you. So it's not a subjective confession. It's not who we think Jesus is. It's who God the Father declares and reveals who Jesus is. And what did Peter confess? He said, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. You are the Savior of the world. That's what the Christ, that word Christ meant. It's not a swear word to our young people, right? Because there's a side story of like the, uh, the, the de-Christianizing of the Western world of a fourth grade teacher teaching fourth graders in the UK, United Kingdom about Christmas and saying about this baby Jesus. And the child raises his hand and goes, why would they name a poor little baby a swear word? It was the question that, that he had asked. But rather, we are seeing this Jesus as a Christ, not as a swear word, but Peter makes this true confession. And Jesus, from the Matthew account, we're able to see is that you didn't figure that out. It's not because you're smart. It's because that was revealed to you by God, by my Father in heaven. So who do we, who do we say Jesus is? But here's the second part here. After that moment of objective, of absolute truth, of understanding who Jesus is, we see Peter making this mistaken shift to a subjective understanding of who Jesus is in our next part of our passage, verse 31 and following. The text doesn't tell us that's what happened, but we can uh, understand from what we read that that's probably what happened mentally in his head. He had this objective, biblical, divine understanding of who Jesus was, but then it shifted to what he thought who Jesus is or what the Christ should be or how Jesus should act. Because here, Jesus then saying, okay, one of you guys get it. Now you see who I am, who I am. I am the Christ. He starts to break it down and explain what his mission's objective is now. Verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and die. And mind you, it's not just Peter here. A lot of the people in, uh, a lot of the Jewish people, they understood the Messiah, they understood the Christ to be not someone who is going to die, but someone who is going to be their political savior to bring them out of the rule of the Roman Empire. And so when, like I said, I'm, I might be surmising a lot, but I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm devi deviating too much from the text here. When Peter, after having that, making that absolute, truthful, divinely revealed confession of who Jesus is, here's what Jesus teaches. Mentally, there was the shift 
of who I think Jesus should be, who I feel Jesus is, and what does he do? After hearing that truth about what the Christ is supposed to endure, verse 32, and he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. We don't know what the content of that rebuke is. I can imagine it could be something like, Jesus, don't say that. You're going to discourage all the other disciples. Like, you're really going to like, crush our hearts and stuff. Don't talk like that. Why would, you, why would you say that? Or maybe it was personal. Where he says, Jesus, you're breaking my heart. You can't die, Jesus. Don't die, Jesus. We don't know what the content is, but nevertheless, he said, no, Jesus, you're wrong. I'm right. He rebukes Jesus is the word that Matt Mark uses here. And then we look at Jesus' response to that. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Once again, the MO of Jesus wasn't to come and live comfortably here on this earth. He had a mission to accomplish. He had people to save. He had sin to pay for. But here was a whispering in the ear, a subjective understanding of, no, Jesus, I know what's better for you. No, Jesus, this is what you should be doing. That's supposed to try and thwart his mission. And he says, Get behind me, Satan. Don't we remember in the road to Emmaus several years ago when I, I taught us about the biblical uh, truth and the, uh, the need for understanding the scriptures through the lens of Christ? When he's teaching the two uh, followers on the road to Emmaus, he says, Do you, don't you know that the Messiah is to suffer and die? We, and he, he explains that from, the, from Moses and the, from the prophets. And he says, that's what the Christ is supposed to endure. And that's what the purpose and the mission's objective of, of Christ is. But here, even with any good intentions, or maybe it was a prideful intention, right? Peter, in his mind, could have been thinking, I finally got it right. You know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm king of the world. And so, but I'll, I'll set Jesus straight, because, like, Jesus, no, no, you shouldn't talk like that. But Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And notice how he describes what's going on here. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is where I want to make and draw out that point of that danger of shifting from a biblical Christology to a subjective Christology. When Peter made his confession, Jesus explains and comments and interprets saying that that was revealed to you by the Father. That's an absolute truth. It's not what you feel about me, who you think I am, what, what you think that I'm all about, but rather that was revealed to you by God, Peter. That's awesome. But here, notice he says, some shift had happened. You were thinking about the things of God and that was revealed to you, but now you're thinking like the world, Peter. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. It's not subjective Christology. It's not what we feel that Jesus is. He is saying, set our minds on the things of God, not on the things of mankind. Because that, in these, at this moment especially, is in contradiction to the will and the mission of God. So brothers and sisters, let us look to a biblical view of who Christ is. And let us cling to that absolute truth. And let us then understand that this Jesus who had the mission of God in mind took your and my sins because before a holy and righteous God, those law-breaking and, 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 and those sins cannot just be brushed under the rug but have to be taken account for. And so Jesus then, as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world, takes that punishment upon himself 
so that you and I can be forgiven and free, so that you and I can be adopted and called to be citizens of a better kingdom, so that we are called then to not think uh, like and have our minds set on this kingdom, but have our minds set on God's kingdom and to think differently, not relativistically, but rather absolutely and biblically according to God's truth. That's something that we are, I believe, called to do. And I believe that's where we see that uh, an example of that uh, problem when you have that shift from thinking absolutely biblically about who Jesus is and then subjectively Jesus. But then now, let me just uh, shift to the final application part here. Will you let me confuse you? <laughs> My apologies in advance. I know this is going to sound confusing. But with regards to our context now, with regards to where our culture is now, I believe the only way we can get our foot in the door and be allowed to speak is to tell people who Jesus is to me. So in our membership class, if you've taken it with me or baptism class, I ask everyone to write their testimony and I ask them to answer, this, uh, answer that question as your testimony. Who is Jesus to you? Once again, that's, that's, a, that's a relativistic or like a, a subjective question, but unfortunately, that's the sign of the times now. That's the only way we're allowed to speak. I remember when I was in 11th grade, this is the 90s, um, the students liked to go hang out during lunch at certain more of the popular teachers' classrooms. And so Ms. Yamaguchi, she was the uh, advisor for, face, uh, for the yearbook, and so a lot of people would hang out there. So I was there one day, and uh, they had a lively discussion on abortion. And so people were kind of going around, the students were kind of going around. She was kind of mediating the, the discussion. Each student was kind of sharing their thoughts and stuff like that. And it was my turn, right? So I was, I was ready, right? And then Ms. Yam goes, David, no, you, you, you don't have to talk. I know what, already what you're going to say. You go to church. That's not your opinion. That's what you were taught. And so, you know, you, you don't have to say anything. I was, I was like, oh, I do that, right? And so this is the early 90s when this happened. Already, because of uh, what I believe or what I was understanding and taught as an absolute truth, I was not permitted to speak. So 30 years later, then how much more then are, uh, do, does the public have more of a kind of allergic reaction to, to absolutes? So that's why I'm saying, though I taught uh, what I just encouraged to say, let's not have a subjective Christology, but a biblical one. But Practically speaking, the only way that we are able to kind of get a chance to speak and voice our, 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 our story is to say, this is who Jesus is to me. And so technically, they, they shouldn't be able to <laughs> uh, cancel you or, or uh, say you're not allowed to tell, because you're saying, this is my story. I'm allowed to tell my story, right? right? And so that's what I want to encourage us to do that then. But after, only after we have now understood the biblical Christ, who, not who we think it, Jesus is, but what, was re, what is revealed to us by the Father in heaven. For Peter, it was, it was a miracle, miraculous supernatural revelation. For us, it is still a miraculous supernatural revelation, but not as fancy. We find it here of who Jesus is revealed to us. And so after then, we see this biblical understanding of who Christ is. Let's go out and be relativistic and say, this is who I believe Jesus is. Or not believe, this is who Jesus is to me. And tell others about who this biblical Christ is. Let us be a church that proclaims this truth because we are recipients of his great mercy and grace, his sacrifice, so that we would be forgiven. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for reminding us of our, of our tendency, of our fleshly tendency to try to think, uh, to think that we, we understand Christianity or we understand Jesus by what we think it is or what we feel it is. But rather, we, but from your text today, we showed us, you showed us and revealed to us the, the dangers of trying to approach Christ without having our minds set on the things of God, but instead set on the things of man. So, Holy Spirit, protect us from doing that. 
prevent us from doing that and, and secure in us a biblical understanding of who Jesus is so that we are able to go and believe it in our hearts and go share it with us, others. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Not who we think you are, but who you are indeed. And may that truth comfort us, encourage us, and be the message of what we proclaim and share. We thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.